Welcome, Patrick, to uh, Investor Motivation Podcast. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now, uh, Patrick is our, uh, one of our local uh, solicitors, lawyers. Which you prefer? Uh, oh, either fine. Either, either either? Fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, we refer a lot of clients on to Patrick that... Uh, uh, yeah, that helps out with the estate planning and all sorts of, of uh, other matters. Being a, a country lawyer, solicitor, um, obviously pretty broad, or is there a certain area that you specialise in, Patrick? Uh, no, definitely very broad. Um, yeah. I guess there are some areas which I do more than others, so I do do a lot of the estate planning and uh, wills, powers of attorney, yeah, property transfers and that kind of thing. But right. um, I have done a bit of family law, a bit of criminal law, commercial law, everything. So right. yeah. uh, it is quite broad sometimes. Yeah, fantastic. So what we were going to focus on today was really an overview of you know, where estate planning comes in with retirement and what people should be thinking about when they get to that stage. And, and obviously well, well prior to that, um, I suppose general estate planning is for everyone, Patrick. Mm. Um, but, um, so people leading in, into retirement, um, you know, what, what should they be thinking about? Um, and from a general estate planning point of view as well. Sure. I mean, like you said, it starts a bit earlier, but at that stage, you really want to make sure your plan's really tight. So um, it's, if you're thinking about the documents that you need in place, um, wills are one that most people um, know of, but also um, powers of attorney. So making sure that if something happened and you um, lost the ability to make decisions yourself, yep. um, that you've got the people that you trust in those roles. So I'm talking there about enduring powers of attorney for personal matters, such as um, if you have to go into care, who you trust to make that decision. Yes. Um, financial matters, um, you know, paying bills on your behalf or even buying and selling property. If you can't make those decisions, who do you want making those decisions? Right. Um, and as you get into those years towards retirement, um, it's going to become uh, more likely that those kind of documents um, become active. So it's really important that they're in place. Right. And, and that's not just because um, I'm about to go into an aged care facility. That could be I'm away for six months on an awesome holiday. That's true. And it could, yeah. be, it could be a different document as well. You could have one that's only active for that period of time. Yep. Um, the other thing is quite often what we do with that power of attorney is um, so that it only becomes active when I do cease to have decision-making capacity. So that's when a doctor says, no, nope, you can't make those decisions yourself anymore. Yep. That's when it becomes active. So you're still in control as long as possible. Yep. And it's only when the doctor makes that determination that it becomes uh, enlivened. Okay. So you can get a separate power of attorney to look after the financials, which might be that bill payment, uh, just while you're away for a certain amount of time. But in the background, can there be the enduring one where, where it really goes pear-shaped and you are unwell? Can they be run you, concurrently, you, can you, they? You can. You definitely can, and there'll just yeah. be a clause in there saying that they are both active. Right. Um, and it is always important to have that enduring power of attorney in the background, but just in case something does go wrong. So yes. say you do suffer a nasty accident and fall into a coma, for example, that you have the person that you trust making those decisions for you. Right. And, and obviously there's financial and the medical one. So having, having both, these are separate documents, Patrick? Yeah, so the... Quite often what we can do is put the personal and financial together in one document. So the personal being, yeah, the, the big one is where you, um, where you live. Yep. And financial, um, you're paying bills on your, on your behalf. That document can normally be the same person. They can be separated if they need to be. Yes. But another document is a medical treatment decision maker. And that's saying um, what medical treatment you consent to and what you refuse, who you trust to make that decision. So say um, you need to have a surgery and you can't make that decision. Who do you trust in that situation? Right. Is this where, with our beneficiaries, we might have some beneficiaries that are more suited with a nursing or you know exactly. health background that takes care of the medical? Exactly right. Yep. Exactly right. Quite often we'll have that where they've got, yeah, say, a nurse, um, and, and they'll be the first person on the list for the medical treatment decision maker. Yep. And then with the financial power of attorney, they might have a, an accountant as a as a son or something like that. And that's normally the person that they would choose first. Right. But um, so you can have that conversation with your solicitor and it will help choose you know, who's right for you yep. to be making those decisions first. Okay. So horses for courses. Exactly. Like right. any game. Uh, Definitely. Group. So obviously talking about retirement can be a trigger and we, we're often sending a lot of clients across to you because mm. they've come to an impasse. It might be retirement, sold a farm, whatever. Mm. Go and get uh, certain work done. Um, what are other triggers for people to think about estate planning? I think the big one is normally children. Um, yep. As soon as you've had kids or, or go into a relationship, suddenly you need to be thinking about um, how you're going to care for those people. 
and what you don't want to happen as well as what you do want to happen. Um, when you've got the children, um, say someone my age, one of the biggest concerns they'll have is who's going to look after the kids yes. if I was to pass. So um, that can be a clause in the will, setting out who you'd trust um, to look after the kids if both um, myself and my work, wife were to pass. Yep. Um, and that's the clause goes in the wills, and um, that's normally who the kids will go to right. if that situ- situation okay. were to arise. Yep. Um, I, had an interest- I had a client in this morning, Patrick, yep. and... You know, been separated and divorced for quite some time, mm. and but he's found a new love, love interest, which is fantastic. Yep. He, w- he was glowing, but you know, he's already you know, separated the assets once already, and he wasn't mm. keen to do it again. Mm. Um, so he's sort of inquiring about um, you know, uh, prenuptials uh, with regards to obviously long term future relationships. Yep. Um, how rock solid are they? Um, they can be. It's, it's a matter of them being done correctly. So yes. um, there are pretty strict requirements on what needs to, to happen there. So one of the big things is um, disclosing all the assets, making sure everyone's aware of everything, but also that both parties have independent legal advice. So there'll right. need to be a certificate at the back of that agreement, yes. which says that each of the parties has gone and got advice on that agreement from a solicitor. And yes. if, if that's not complied with, that agreement won't hold up. Okay. Yeah. And, and as time progresses, as people you know bond and form, you know, decade-long relationships, mm. these agreements can be tweaked and changed to suit? They can, they can. Um, I guess it's, it's better to do it early rather than late. Yep. Um, but they can be updated, you know, even during the relationship. Yes. And even after an agre- after the relationship, an agreement can be reached right. in that way as well. Excellent. All right. Yeah, now, that was one from this morning, so it was a, yeah, just one of those questions... That, that we all get, um, mm. and you know, these things are often it can be, yeah, more common in the scenarios and new relationships later in life. But yep. um, you know, this you know, if this relationship goes well for this client, it could be a thirty-year, you know, relationship That's for you, right. and he's going to want to perhaps make sure that she is well looked after mm. um, in in her later stages. Yep. Um, so, what are some of the, the I suppose the the mistakes that people make? In state planning, apart from actually not doing it, because I know the stats are not good. That's what I was going to say. The first one is not <laughs> okay. making one, because right. uh, so often um, people haven't made anything at all, um, yep. and that can just cause a, a big problem because you know the kids can say, "Oh, well, Mum really wanted this to happen." It's, well, if it's not in writing, that's not what's happening. Right. So, and, and what's the stats? Is is it? Oh, I, you know, I, I did have a look at it recently. I think it's um, more than half don't. I think it's it's around right. that figure anyway. So okay. it's, it's pretty scary, really, when you think of how many people are out there. Yep. Uh, without a will. Um, the other thing is just thinking the will's all they need. I mean, as we talked about a bit earlier, so often things happen where, you know, you, you don't pass away, but you can't make your own decisions anymore. Mm-hmm. And having those documents in place to cover that situation is just so important. Yep. And, and we'll double back to the, um, the medical power of attorney and advanced care directives uh, on a little bit. Um, for someone that doesn't have a will, mm. um, what's the process in, in terms of it just gets a hell of a lot harder. Is that, uh, in, in the nutshell, your job to someone that, would, that dies intestate? Is that the right word? It is the right word. Uh, it's not probably, I mean, it's, it's, it's a different job. It's probably not much harder for the people um, processing in the estate, yep. but it's a matter of just things not going where they should. Um, if quite often there's you know items or there's something that someone wants to happen and they'd put in their will if they were to make one, yep. if they don't make that, it doesn't happen. So... Um, say someone dies, um, single person with kids, um, and it's just divided down the line equally. Yep. But that doesn't account for you know gifts that might have been made or loans that might have been made. They might have one of the children might have helped them out more than the others. None of those considerations are taken into account. It's just look at legislation that goes down the line. Right. So um, really, to make sure what you want happen happens, you need the will in place. Yep. Um, Patrick, obviously DIY will kits. Mm. I'm not even sure. If, I think they used to be available at the post office. Are they still a thing? They are still a thing, and they still um, make law firms more money. I, that's the way I look at them. Yep. Um, quite often people will say, no, I'm not going to go to the lawyer. I'm going to just go and get one of these will kits to save money. But in the long run, they end up being a lot more expensive. So um, I've had quite a few cases where um, the will kit has been completed incorrectly. So it might have been witnessed incorrectly or um, to missing complete clauses. The cost to actually go through the Supreme Court to get those fixed up yep. uh, runs into the thousands of dollars. Okay. Whereas if you just go in and go to see the solicitor in the first place, talk it through, get the clauses in there you want, yep. um, you're much better off in the long run. Yeah, and it's probably fair to say your know, clients, you know, that when you're doing will, uh, a proper will with a solicitor, mm. 
Um, it's probably not the most expensive part of the, the process. You know, the back end when you die and a, a will's been administered, things are, are more expensive there, but to actually That's have right. a will's not a dreadfully expensive thing. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay, so so will will kits are still about, but definitely not recommended. Spot on. Yep, fantastic. Um, for people, yeah, I suppose any extra tips for when people as they get older and um, yeah, in terms of list of their assets, you know, as people mm. get age, obviously our, our memories are not not improving. Mm. Uh, at fifty, mine's definitely not getting any better. Um, but yeah, should there be a book set aside somewhere with passwords, with list of assets? Or... Yeah, no, that's a great idea. I mean, you want to have it as easy as possible for those people that are looking after your estate once you pass. Yep. Um, so, yeah, having your key documents, you know, your, your, where your bank accounts are, um, what your investments are, um, even your car registration, pretty much any of those important documents, put them in one place and yep. let your executors know where that is so that when you pass, it's just an easy job for them. Right. Um, and, yeah, with pass, passwords... Um, definitely, if it's something that you want to, to, to live on, um, you really do need to pass them on because once you've gone, no one's going to know what that is. So right. uh, cryptocurrency, which is probably not too many of your clients are dealing with. No. no, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if, if they pass away with um, their password, that's it, it's gone. So, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so some sort of notepad. Record. Or, yeah, and, yep. and yeah, who the professionals are is, is vital as well. Yeah, who, that's who, a good who idea. You deal with. I mean, quite often uh, when you, when we do a will, for example, you'll have a copy of the will and that will yep. stay with those documents um, and then they can get to the solicitor and find a lot of that information out because we do record that in our appointments. Yes. But having as many of those details together um, straight away just makes the job a bit easier for everyone. Right. Um, we'll just uh, circle back to the... Um, yeah, the enduring power of attorney, the, the medical side of it. Mm. Um, and I had, this is quite a few years ago, one of my very good clients, um, you know, who gave me the heads up about advanced care directives. And, and she had the experience of, you know, a, a, a close relative that, you know, there was a chance, had a degenerative disease, had a chance, to, you know, where they could have let, you know, the doctors, nurses could have let him go, mm. but didn't, and lasted five years in a vegetative state. Yeah. Um, so she was a big advocate for these documents. Yeah. Um, can you give a bit of an overview of what these are and, and how and how they help uh, in your medical power of attorney holder? Yeah, so that's the, that's the way I normally describe it. It's, it's really making the job of the medical treatment decision maker that much easier because it's setting out how you wish to be treated yep. and you can include in there a, a, a binding um, direction on what medical treatment you consent to and what you refuse. So um, in the documents that we prepare, the first two pages are really just details about you, your your health issues, what's important to you, what worries you, um, and how you'd feel about different situations. And then the next two pages are the actual legal binding part, right. and that is what medical treatment you consent to and what you refuse. Yes. And what we normally suggest is those first two pages um, you complete before going into your doctor, yeah. and then the last two pages um, actually talk to your doctor about and make sure that um, you're happy um, with what goes in that document because it is binding um, and it's important to get right. And so I'll just say as well, uh, that's the one document out of the documents we've been talking about which isn't completed with a lawyer as a witness. Yep. That one actually needs to be witnessed by a, a medical practitioner. Great. And as the way that I've been terming to clients, it means mm. that you, whoever's holding a medical power of attorney is not flying blind. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it can be a tough job and yeah. to have that document helping them just, yep. just makes it a lot easier. Yeah, here's the direction without having to have the conversation over the Christmas table. Exactly right. Yeah, who, yep. who wants to have that conversation generally with our kids? It can be pretty awkward. Yeah, yep. fantastic. Um, Patrick, when it comes to estates being contested, mm. and when we're, obviously we know what's happened with farm valuations of late, um, the chances where, the, where there's multi-million dollar inheritances now, mm. the chances for things to be contested is probably going to ratchet up over the, the coming years. Um, how do you best avoid that for people that are retired and they've got these big sums of money uh, that might be worried about, you know, how do you stop the kids having a dust up after they're gone? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one because there's no, um, there's no way of just saying, you know, with an ironclad will. Sometimes we get clients come in and ask for an ironclad will. Yep. Unfortunately, I can't do that. But what we can do is um, have the discussion of, you know, what is the situation with the family dynamic? What is likely to occur? What's the history in terms of who's received what? How can we make it as fair as we can while yep. still 
being in line with your wishes. And if there is someone that we're wanting to leave out, explaining why that is. So actually having that background in there so that if it does get contested and it goes to court, they can look at the solicitor's file notes, which quite often they will, and yes. will actually give that explanation of why they were left out. Right. And we can also include a clause in the will itself, um, setting out a bit of that reason of why they were left out as well. Right. If we do need to go down that path. Yeah. Now, of course, that won't stop the will being contested. No. But it'll help get the wishes through. That's right. Yeah. It's more likely that if it is contested, um, they're a little bit less likely to succeed in okay. that contesting of it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, another big part of it as well is, is having the conversations, not making promises, but um, sometimes talking about, you know, how it's going to work with the kids can mean that everyone's a little bit more comfortable when it does come um, to time to, to administer the will, so when, yes. when, you, when you pass, um, that everyone kind of knows what was going to happen and aren't shocked by it. I think that yep. that probably helps a little bit as well. Okay, so you're, set, you're about talking about setting the expectation right. So if, exactly. mum, if mum and dad say, this is what you're, you, you would expect to, up here in terms of dollars... Yep. And you deliver here yep. a, a lower mark uh, amount. That's when people get upset. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so good communication. Yeah. Good file notes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. So having that conversation, if there's someone you want to leave out or treat differently, just explain why, and, yes. and then that can be documented. Right. Yep. Yeah. And do you find that where the will's simple? You know, there's two kids and it's fifty-fifty, or it's four kids and it's twenty-five yeah. percent each. That's yeah. pretty rare that that's contested. Right, yeah. 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 What's to argue about? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and when people have a crack at an estate, mm. who, who pays for the legal fees? It, it does vary. Um, so there's, I think there's been a bit more of a trend now um, to not saying automatically that uh, the estate's going to pay, which was probably a bit of an expectation a, a few years ago. But yeah. um, it, it really does depend on what the outcome is. So normally... When, when you go to court and, you, and if you went right to the end of the trial and you won, normally you get your costs awarded. So if someone, someone right. successfully um, contested the will, yep. normally they would get their costs. But um, it just depends on the merits of the actual claim, I guess, is the best way of summarising that. If they've right. got a strong claim, they're probably more likely to get their costs. Yes. If they've got a weak claim, they're less likely. Okay, so whoever has a crack at the will, mm. there is a risk for them that if they lose, it's... The money it's on them that's right to pay their own and also the estate exactly right okay yep. so yeah so it would probably help reduce the amount of what's the word frivolous uh claims, claims? is that is that the right word yeah yeah, yeah. It, should. it should it should i don't know if it always does but it should yeah yeah okay yeah uh, there's yeah. an old saying which uh, when there's a will there's a relative is that <laughs> yeah that's you, right you it's probably that one before. yeah um now we mentioned about um obviously yeah people uh retiring and selling farms and obviously mm. we're in a rural area here so the numbers we're seeing are, are, are really big mm. um, and I often mention testamentary trusts mm. um, now could you give us an overview of of that space where, where where it is appropriate for obviously wealthy retirees yeah that's right I mean we don't really consider it when it's a smaller estate so um, but when you're looking at the the huge um, prices the farms have been getting recently um, it really does make sense to, to put the structure in place. So the easiest way to explain it, I think, is um, similar to a family trust, which people are quite often familiar with, where you've got um, a trustee of the trust um, looking after the beneficiary. So quite often mum and dad will be the trustees mm -hmm. um, and they're distributing income to each other and the kids. Yep. What a testamentary trust is, is a trust that's only created on the death of the will maker and it's actually part of the will. So you've got your almost the start of your standard will but then with an additional few clauses and then a trustee at the back um, which allows the beneficiaries to actually have the funds go into their own trust. Right. Um, now, there can be um, different benefits on that depending on the circumstances. So um, sometimes it can be used for asset protection. Um, it can be used for succession planning. Um, but quite often it's significant taxation benefits as well, especially when right. we're talking the figures we're talking with these farms yep. uh, and we've got the option to um, distribute income. Um, it can be, you know, really big savings. Yeah, okay. And I think the... Um, I recommended a client um, yeah, set one up, and he's uh, he's solicitor. He's in New South Wales, yep. um, and you know early sixties. But the solicitor wrote up the will, you know, to establish one trust, and there's mm. three kids. Mm. Um, and I see you know the feedback I gave, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm. but you know, thirty years down the track, with this client's finished, and he's got three children or married or remarried yep. with then possibly adult grandchildren, there's no way ever that one trust is going to work across 
three finance fight family units. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I see that a little bit. I've, yeah. I've seen that a few solicitors do do it that way. Um, but what I feel is, is best is with every beneficiary has their own trust. Yes. Um, and they've got complete control of that trust. And yep. this stops um, those disputes happening because you're quite right. You've got that many um, people trying to all make one decision um, or influencing each other's decisions. It's quite often it's not going to end well. Yeah, so it, yeah. it just won't work. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we're on the same page there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so definitely, you know, it, it's probably also about whether a testamentary trust is viable or not is one, the amount of money. Mm. And if you've got, you know, kids that are in business, you know, a doctor or something there, yep. and they're highly suable mm. just because of their occupation, mm. you know, that would be ideal for them because those assets are protected yep. for bankruptcy and litigation. Yes. Um, yeah. Sorry, Rob, I'm... For, for the testamentary trust yep. itself? Um, yeah, it's, it has got that layer of protection by being in the trust environment. Right. Yes, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the the process, which I'm not. You know, I've never done personally, but what's the what, you you hold a client's will? Mm. Someone passes away. Yeah. What's the process? So the first thing is uh, they'll normally get a phone call saying, um, you know, my my father's died, my mother's died. Um, they'll come in for an appointment with me, and what we'll do is we'll talk about. Um, what their assets were. So normally, when we're talking about those things earlier, what documents are important. It's great if you have the you know the list of the bank accounts, um, where the investments are held. Yeah. Um, then we'll talk about um, you know who the account is as well, if the uh, tax returns required. Um, and then what we do once the clients left, um, we'll contact the um, asset company. So that could be the banks or the, the managed funds or whoever it is. Yeah. Um, ask for details of those funds um, and the amounts at the date of death. Mm-hmm. Um, Quite often, what will be required is a grant of probate. So what a grant of probate is, is um, really the formal recognition by the court that the executor's names in the will um, are authorised to act on behalf of the will. Right. And so what that means is that that grant of probate, which used to be a nice big piece of parchment, it's now just an electronic grant, right. um, can be sent off to those asset companies and they'll rely on that to release the funds into our trust account. Yep. Um, and then from there, we can prepare a distribution in accordance with the will. Now, that process can take some time because you're waiting on those asset companies to come back. Right. Then we've got to advertise an intention to apply for a grant of probate on the Supreme Court website. Yep. It has to be up there for two weeks, which is all a bit, a bit of a, a weird kind of thing. But what that is for is to, if someone is thinking of contesting the will, um, they, they can see that that's been advertised and they right. can actually um, be prepared for that. Um, once the... Um, once that's been advertised, about two weeks is normally the period it takes for the court to come back with the grant of probate. Yep. Um, and then it's sending it out back to those asset companies and getting those assets in. Um, once those assets are in, we prepare a, a draft distribution statement which says, this is how we intend to distribute the estate. And the executors say, yep, that looks right to me. Or okay. hang on for your Mr. Number there, which isn't normal, very yeah. common. Um, and then it's distributed to the beneficiaries. Great. And you're guiding the executors? Yeah. Obviously, exactly. And that's the probably back a step that you have a will and you nominate the executors which are the people that will administer the will and and when a grant of probate is just the the court saying or the the system saying yep they're right to do that that's pretty yeah. that's pretty much right and yep. saying everyone can rely on this because we're the court yes. um and so yeah the executors still have all of the the jobs of you know preparing a house for sale if that's there and um, getting all the personal belongings in and, and dealing with the cars and that kind of thing. Yep. Um, but the solicitors can handle really the money side of right. it all. Fantastic. Yep. Um, now moving on to superannuation, given that super is making up a pretty lumpy part mm. of people's estates now, yeah. and obviously uh, superannuation doesn't form part of a will uh, unless... Unless, uh, exactly, unless there's a buying death nomination put in place. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, because it's held in that trust arrangement, it doesn't automatically. Um, and so, what can happen is um, people assume, oh, I've got my will saying this is to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what's going to happen to my super. But uh, no, it, it doesn't unless that form's been completed. Um, so, with that as well, there's a few tricks to getting that buying death nomination um, right. So, the first one is getting the form of it correct. Is, but there's been cases that have said, you know, you, it needs to be strictly in compliance with the trust deed. So mm-hmm. um, those with self-managed super funds is especially important as well because they might be doing their own forms. Yep. Um, but also choosing the right people um, because we can have significant tax consequences there as well. So um, some people might, um, for example, go, no, I'm not going to leave it to my partner. I'll go straight to the kids. 
and in terms of taxation that's that's not ideal because um, tax free to the spouse usually um, yep. and then giving it to an adult child normally there will be tax eating away at that so yes. um, having those conversations with your solicitor is important as well they'll normally be able to guide you on that yep. um, but yeah buying death on national as you said because there's so much money in superannuation really important to get that right yep. and with a binding death nom you can nominate legal Yours. represent so the estate itself so exactly right. so they can go there but um, yeah Patrick also mentioned the the tax you know if, it, if there's taxable components in your super and it, go, it goes to non-financial dependents mm. which can be your children they're just not financially dependent on you there'll be a 70 percent tax yep. and and higher tax if there is uh, insurance uh, the, within the superannuation fund as well yep. again goes goes tax free to you know, your spouse, your financial dependence. Mm. Um, so, yeah, definitely need to seek advice in that area, and that's where yeah your financial client, financial planner, accountant, solicitor can work together to make sure those documents are, are executed correctly and uh, the outcomes are as tax, as tax effective as as possible. Definitely, mm. fantastic. Um, going back to basics, which mm. we should have probably done at the start, but that's, <laughs> that's okay. Yep. Um, yeah, we, we mentioned that superannuation is actually not a willable asset. Mm. What other assets that people might assume or you know, form part of their will but actually aren't? Uh, well, quite often we go back to the farming example again. Lots of people are farming through um, companies and trusts. Yep. And again, because they're, they've got their own um, identities, they're not falling in personal um, estates. So um, what that can mean is that there's a few extra documents that are required. So um, with the, the trust, quite often it's who gets control of that trust once I pass. So it might be appointing uh, a subsequent appointor, so the person who controls who um, appoints trustees. That can be uh, documents required, and with the companies, quite often it's uh, a matter of gifting the shares in that company in your will as well, and right. making sure um, the people that you want to have control of that structure yes. um, do actually have control. Okay, and, and if we talk about people's homes, mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's joint tenants mm -hmm. and there's tenants in common. Yes, um, just to confuse everyone. Uh, yep. Can you dumb that down for me, please? Yeah, I think it's probably it's a good. Uh, space we're talking on to make it easy because we're talking about wills and it's probably yep. the easiest way to explain it so joint tenants um, won't fall under your will it will just automatically go to the survivor right so quite often husband and wife that's how they'll own a property um, so say um, I die it would just automatically go to my wife Emma yep um, tenants in common is different um, so what it would normally say is something like um, Patrick has one of two shares Emma has one of two shares yes and when I die I can say oh I want my one share to go to my brother. And Emma can say, I want my one share to go to my one sister. So you actually are able to leave your interest in your will. Okay. So tenants in common, mm. would that be more uh, preferred for, say, second marriages where the, the obviously I'm not looking for advice here, but mm. um, yeah, tenants in common where they can will their part. Exactly right. No, yeah. I, I think that's spot on. Quite often it, it is preferable when you've got that um, second marriage and, and kids, each got kids to a different um, relationship, um, you can leave your interest to, to your children and, yes. and your partner can leave their interest to their children. Fantastic. So, uh, right. Yeah, no, definitely. Great, great explanation. Thank you for that. All right, I reckon that's um, probably covered off all what I was after around estate planning, particularly with a bit of a retirement slant. Um, so thank you very much, Patrick. Um, Thanks, please man. remember, everyone, this is general advice only. That's a, more of a financial advice thing we need to stipulate. No, no, um, I'll, I'll take that as well. Do, do the we, same. Exactly yep. right. Yeah, we, yeah you're, you're the lawyer. You should have more disclaimers <laughs> than me. But, um, <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, please seek personal financial advice that's um, yeah, more in line with your personal needs. And, uh, yeah, we'll catch you next week. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.